Hi, everybody. So I didn't bring slides because there's a lot to talk about and the slides are very overwhelming and then you'll all go to the bar and it'll be terrible. But I'm Julie Selesnick, I'm a lawyer in Washington DC and a class action law firm and we focus on healthcare, uh, rule ERISA healthcare matters and since the passage of the CAA, obviously that's become, you know, a lot more, um, there's a lot more teeth to what we've been doing now. And also, because of the difficulties in implementing the CAA and using it, um, you know, what has developed is actually a consulting practice helping employers figure out, okay, the law says I can do this, but if the vendor says no, can I really do it? So it's been a really interesting past few years trying to make some of these things work. And listening to what's happened so far today, you know, it's about... Um, the role of employers, advisors, physicians, and sort of this healthcare movement. So I guess I'll talk about the role of lawyers. And there's not, you know, a huge number of lawyers that are into this yet, but it's growing. And, you know, even though no one likes lawyers till so they need one usually, um, here the lawyers can be helpful because they're trying to sort of make it so that these rights that, that employers have and that, and that members of self-funded plans have and members of fully insured plans have can actually be realized. So they're not just on paper, but that you can actually you know, assert them and make bad behavior stop. And we all know there's a lot of bad behavior to stop. So I'm going to talk about sort of what's going on with the CAA. And I'll give you just a brief history of that first. I'm going to assume that most people here know the basics. So. First of all, um, I was listening earlier, and just so you know, you've always been a fiduciary to your health plan under ERISA. Um, the CAA didn't make that, that's not new, it just gave you tools for the first time to actually do your fiduciary duties properly. So several years ago, um, one of the duties as an ERISA fiduciary is a duty to monitor the service providers that you hire to help with your plan. And as you can see, it's very difficult to monitor some of the service providers that you hire in a health plan because they don't allow it really. And so the DOL had actually, the Department of Labor had gone after a couple of employers and sued them saying they were failing the duty to monitor. And they lost those cases mainly because the employers could show they were, which is amazing, you know, these were good employers that they went after. And the employers were able to show that they were doing everything they could possibly do to monitor, and if they weren't able to, it was not, it was through no fault of their own, and there was really no tools that existed to sort of help them do this. So Congress started also, um, you know, considering how to strengthen ERISA, because ERISA was really written for pensions. I mean, it talks about welfare plans and health benefit plans, but it came out in 1974. It was written to really regulate unions that in, in the thought was, you know, that unions were stealing from, um, from funds and that that was what the DOL primarily did at the beginning. And really then it became hyper-focused on 401ks and pensions. And then as you know, there's been like 20 years of excessive fee litigation and things like that. And actually ERISA has really helped lower the fees in those employee benefit plans. So all of a sudden you realize health, the health plans are most employers' second biggest spend after payroll. And so it's time for ERISA to sort of be beefed up a little and do what it's meant to do because it's meant to regulate all employee benefit plans. And health plans are in really rough shape, as I'm sure we all know. So the first, so what happens is we get the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And the CAA, that's just the spending bill that's passed every year. So there's a CAA of 2020, 2021, 2022. But for some reason, in that bill were several provisions that have made, you know, have opened up a lot of seams that are now being used by a lot of different employers, different vendors, and they're leading to these lawsuits. And they were really aimed at increasing transparency and giving, in particular, plan fiduciaries the ability to, um, you know, have more insight into what's happening in the plan. But with that insight also comes more responsibility. There's additional filing requirements now and disclosures and things that have to be done. And there's really four main provisions. There's the gag clause prohibition, so that's the first section, section 201, and that just says, so the problem with the CAA, I'm about to go through all of these, is that the burden is on the employer every time not to do this, and there's really no way to, there, there's currently no mechanism to force the service providers to also follow this, and they'll tell you, 
you know, well, that I'm not bound by that law, you are. And so if you don't like what I'm offering, you find somebody else. So this is the difficulty. But this first one, gag clause prohibition. If you're an employer, you can't enter into a contract with a network um, or a network or a provider that gives you access to a network of providers. So basically with a carrier, TPA, PBM, that prevents you from accessing cost and quality information, including you know, electronic access on an ongoing basis to de-identified data, including every single field and encounter that exists in the, the vendors, whatever they have, you should have access to. And it even includes financial terms in provider contracts that affect the payment of claims. And anyone who's you know, tried to make any headway in the gag clause area, the hardest thing to do is, you know, if you are able to get data and review claims, you'll see that, you know, some might make sense, some you'll find some mistakes, and some you'll just be like, I have no idea why these claims were paid this way. Well, usually it's something in the contract between the carrier and the provider, and the law technically allows you to know this provision, but this has been the most difficult piece of implementation because a lot of those provisions violate ERISA and are anti-competitive and they're the types of things that, you know, th people don't want you to know. And so really those are the things that require court action to gain access to. And that's where employers and unions have taken the lead in trying to, to make headway is trying to get access to data. Now, the second um, CAA law is, so Section 202 was 408B2 disclosures. These are compensation disclosures. All of a sudden, it occurred to you know, um, Congress that just like in a 401k plan, it would make sense to know what a plan is paying its service providers, whether those service providers are also receiving any indirect compensation. So indirect compensation is like, um, you didn't get paid from the plan, but you got paid from the carrier because you placed the plan with that carrier, or you got paid from stop loss or something like that. And right now, plans have just no insight into that. And as we'll talk about shortly, some of the litigations by employees, um, you know, focus on the fact that if you had gotten a proper compensation disclosure, maybe you wouldn't have just blindly listened to your broker um, place you with someone that they're conflicted by. So that's an area where employees are taking the lead against plans. And also, the Department of Labor is starting, I mean, Congress is actually interested, and we'll get into that at the end. Third area is um, prescription drug and data collection and reporting. And so this is, again, supposed to help plans understand, in particular, what are the drivers of the spend when it comes to prescription drugs? That's the main focus. And to get some insight into rebates, because you know this is becoming a non-issue as the word rebate is used less and less nowadays. But really, plans still don't know, um, you know, even if they have a guaranteed amount they're going to get, that doesn't let you know how much you're not getting. And you have to know that to know if that's reasonable compensation. And so this is supposed to help you gain access to that type of information. But, you know, so far the PBMs have been very cagey about this and they like to submit data in the aggregate so that you and your plan can't have it on an individual level. However, there's, there's a sort of safe harbor provision that the... Um, Health and Human Services isn't going to allow anymore. So plans really can assert themselves starting next June. And if they want to submit on an individual level, the law certainly says they can. So the fourth area is mental health parity. And I would assume that most of you are familiar with this because it's been the most splashy over the past several years. Um, it's the most active litigation-wise, for sure. And really, it, what the focus in the CAA, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, was about non-quantitative treatment limitations. So, like, it's pretty obvious what a quantitative treatment limitation is, and we all got that. You can't, you know, offer different um, number of visits or charge more for mental health or substance use disorder coverage than for medical or surgical care. But what the non-quantitative treatment analysis says is you have to look at how your plan is designed and see if it operates in a way that is unfair on the mental health or substance use disorder side. So like for instance, 
Are you treating levels of, of care the same on each side? Are you, you know, allowing residential treatment or something akin to that, like skilled nursing on the medical side, where someone's inpatient for several weeks, but if it's substance use disorder or mental health, and you know, you put them in a residential treatment program, is it the same type of care? Or are you trying to start discharging them, you know, like within that day and trying to get a quick plan? So that's been a more difficult area, and unfortunately the lead there has been taken by the Department of Labor, and the rules have been very confusing and have changed a lot. So it's hard for plans right now to even do a proper comparative analysis. But this one, you know, is very important because you have to do this report every year. You're supposed to look at your plan and have a report, and it's a plan document. So if it's requested by a participant or anyone who has a right to make such a request under ERISA's 104B, you have to provide it within 30 days, or you're looking at, like, daily per member per plan penalties on that. So it's very important to get one. Every year so far, the DOL looks at about 160 or so, and they write a report to Congress. And I don't think they've ever seen one yet, a plan that they were like, this is good. Not ever. But, you know, they do correct, and they will work with you to correct violations. But this is an area, again, where the TPA is going to get employers in trouble, and the DOL has been really taking the lead on this, and, and they've been issuing subpoenas and doing some other things. So let's just now quickly run through these four, you know, four things from a legal perspective, starting with employee lawsuits, because this is, you know, the area that I think if you're an employer, you're the most worried about. And, you know, so you don't just want to move away from the current system because it's expensive and it's low value and you might not be able to give as good a health care as you want to your employees and their families, but you're also like hugely exposed to risk. <laughs> and the current system, you know, you don't even know sort of if you're an employer, what could get me sued and what can I do about it? Because the cases are sort of in their infancy and it's also still in some cases, an employer can legitimately say, like, I really tried, but I was unable to do this. And it really having a fiduciary process in place helps minimize risk while this period of change goes on. But, the, you know, there's a sort of a couple of themes emerging in the litigation we're seeing. So the first case that was filed by employees against their plan was actually filed, like, in early 2023, and it's before the Third Circuit right now, and it was former employees of MetLife, and they sued MetLife because they said the plan kept all the rebates that it got back from the PBM when it should have used the rebates to lower plan costs and to lower the cost share of participants. Um, they lost because the court found they had no standing because they didn't have the right to have you know, access to those rebates. And it's currently before the Third Circuit. And I think the question, so I don't, I'm not going to bore you with like this big legal doctrine of standing, but this is what makes it hard in ERISA cases is this. You have to show that you were like actually suffered a concrete injury. And what the courts think are concrete injuries are like really hard sometimes. Like they don't find normal things to be injuries in ERISA. But here, I think if the Third Circuit finds that, um, employees can show that they're paying some of the overcharge out of pocket, their portion of a drug, and they're not getting that portion back of the rebate. I do think that's standing because that's an out of pocket loss, but that sort of hasn't been the direction this has gone in yet. So that case is on appeal and is probably not going to, you know, change, change much, but you never know. Then the next case, um, Matt mentioned it, and we're going to hear from the plaintiff tomorrow is the J&J lawsuit and Ann Lewandowski is here. And this is a case against Johnson & Johnson. And, you know, they're a drug company, so this is, you know, obviously it's automatically sort of a sexier case that you're suing them because they didn't give good drug prices to their employees, right? And they, they know better. And, and even, you know, they benefit from this type of a system. And the allegations there are sort of that not only did they breach the duty of prudence in poorly selecting a PBM and of, of you know, allowing um, them, their, their participants to be steered into higher cost drugs and to pay absurdly high amounts for what are called generic specialty drugs, um, you know, which some people tell me there's actually no such thing as that and that shouldn't be a name, but this is a category where the fees are sort of off the charts. 
and things that, you know, anyone can look up. And if you look, you know, on, online right now and look at Cost Plus or the one we all use, good, I forget what it's called right now, but we go into the pharmacy, um, you can see the price. So you know that you're paying too much. And the question was, you know, why would J&J &J allow this and why did they have Express Scripts? So this is who's named as the PBM, Express Scripts. And there's allegations of, you know, disloyalty, like allowing them to steer to their mail order and specialty when it was clearly not the best deal. And very interesting, this is where the compensation disclosure will come in, the part of the CAA about the fee disclosure. Um, there's an allegation that if they had got, if Johnson & Johnson had probably understood better where Aon's compensation came from, and Aon was the name broker, then they might have realized there was a conflict here, because Aon is probably getting indirect compensation from ESI. So there's a lot more than that, and I'm not going to, you know, go into it too much, but it's very interesting. Again, I think there's going to be, it's going to depend on how the judge sees standing and what the named plaintiff can show that her actual out-of-pocket concrete injuries were to see if that case will go forward. But I hope it does. And then the next case that's filed that's very similar to that is the case against Wells Fargo, which is really recent. And, you know, that case is pretty crazy because there's a lot of allegations that are very similar to the Johnson & Johnson lawsuit and the same sort of overpaying for specialty generic and steering inappropriately to ESI, same cast of characters, ESI and Aon. But here, I hope it's a mistake. There's an allegation that Wells Fargo let um, the PBM keep all the rebates. And I can't imagine that that is correct. But if it is, I think that's just hugely problematic. Um, another problem or something that makes this case interesting is that Wells Fargo, at, the, at some of the relevant time, was apparently giving advice about PBMs. And they were publishing all these papers and saying things like, you know, don't let a PBM, you know, one of the big PBMs make the cost of your plan rise. And, and giving advice and not taking it, doing all the things that were against the advice they were giving. So that's probably not gonna you know, look well for them if the case proceeds to discovery. But again, we're gonna have to first see if the plaintiffs can establish that they were personally injured and paid too much out of pocket. Then there's one more case that's been filed, and this one isn't about drug prices, and it's pretty interesting because it's against the employer and the TPA. And so it's against Mayo Clinic and um, Medica. And so what happened was an employee at a branch of Mayo Clinic tried to find a primary care uh, mental health, you know, a, a therapist for her daughter. And she couldn't find anyone in network. Uh, and then she used the tool that was provided by the TPA by Medica. And so the SPD said, if there's no in-network, then you can go out of network and we'll charge you the in-network rate. So she did. And then they charged her not the in-network rate. And so she first complained to her employer, and Medica told her that she should have called first, and they would have found her an in-network doctor, and she, she didn't do it right, but that's not what the SPD says. So that's, it seems to me that that's an obvious violation of ERISA that's problematic. Also, having a network search tool that doesn't function properly is a problem. Also, sending EOBs that don't explain how your claims were paid is a problem. So some of those claims are definitely going to live to see another day, like they're not going to get dismissed at the beginning. And this woman paid you know, thousands of dollars out of pocket because of the way Medica repriced the claims. And one of the more interesting claims is that you know it's impossible to know how out-of-network claims would be repriced in the plan because there's like five options they could use you know um, they they could use their proprietary algorithm or maybe they're gonna do it based on a national average maybe they're gonna look at you know um, usual and customary but there wasn't any sort of certainty so I think that'll be interesting for the future because it is important and incumbent on employers to have plans that employees can understand what things are gonna cost. And out of network is a real smushy, fuzzy area in a lot of plans where the employer doesn't even know how they're gonna be priced. And so they're definitely, you know, this will be an interesting case to watch. And one of the claims brought in this case is a RICO claim. So a RICO claim is like a racketeering claim. And I doubt that'll survive. It's alleging that the Mayo Clinic and, and Medica sort of acted in concert together to do this. And to me, it more is an example of 
your CPA is going to get you in trouble if you just allow these things. And this is why employers have to take more ownership now, because they are ultimately responsible for having, you know, um, good networks that are searchable, finding in network doctors, having proper SPDs, um, and of course, in pricing things properly. So that's what's happening right now. And as you can see, mostly it's focused on the drug, on drug prices. And that makes sense because employees have more access to the drug pricing information. It's still really difficult to get access to hospital pricing information and anything on the healthcare side, even for plans. So that's gonna be a slower side to develop, but Mayo Clinic is an interesting star, and I think repricing is going to be a hot button issue in the future. And so, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. So now, the second area are suits where instead of being the defendant, employers and unions are the plaintiffs. And so, you know, you can pick which seat you want to be in here because the CAA has room for everyone. And what's happening is it's mostly about claims data access. And it's also in many of them, once they get the claims data, sort of a, oh my God, what I'm seeing is you've done a terrible job and you paid all these things wrong and you overpaid and this doesn't match the posted prices, doesn't match the transparency files and you didn't apply, you know, the edits that you were supposed to. So I would say the biggest um, target to date has been Aetna by a mile. They've been sued by Kraft Heinz, Aramark, W.W. Granger, Huntsman, and you know, that's it so far, but that's a pretty impressive list since this is a pretty new area. And they're all, it's all the same lawyer and law firm, so they're, they're pretty similar cases. And what they say is, you know, you withhold data, you withhold access, and then when we get it, we see that you're grossly mismanaging the plan. So you've got your gag clause prohibition issue from the CAA, and then when they do get the data, which usually happens in court, they it's, they see all kinds of overpayments. And an interesting claim, now Aetna usually says, you know, right in their documents that they're a claims fiduciary when it comes to just claims. So that makes it easier to bring these cases because you see they breach their fiduciary duties if they're not pricing claims correctly. And one of the claims I like in these cases is saying, you know, Aetna isn't adjudicating our claims the way they're adjudicating their own claims. So if this was under a fully insured plan, it would have been done differently because it's their risk. But when they're doing it in my self-funded plan, they're not doing all of those things. And I think that you know is an interesting issue. And it's, it really highlights the conflict of interest in allowing insurance carriers to be TPAs. There's always going to be that conflict that you could benefit your fully insured line of business at the expense of the self-funded line of business. So those will be interesting to watch. There were some earlier cases against Anthem, Owens v. Minor, and there was another one, and those both settled. But I'm actually involved in a couple of other cases that are still pending. One is um, a couple of local labor unions in Connecticut have sued various parts of Anthem, again, for not sharing data and for pricing claims wrong, and for not you know, giving the discounts that they promised, things like that. And so we're still litigating that, and we had you know, gotten partially dismissed um, several months ago, but the judge sort of set out a roadmap of what he wanted to see to make that case survive. And so with the amended pleading, the problem that sometimes happens when employers try to sue is that they say, you were acting as a fiduciary when you did this because, you know, if the employer has no ability to understand how a claim was paid, it's hard to say the employer is the fiduciary in that situation. But the courts really haven't agreed with that so far, or it's mixed, you get mixed reviews. So what we did when we amended is we added a count where you, under ERISA, it's a breach, whether you're a fiduciary or not, because you're causing um, a fiduciary breach and they're a party in interest causing a fiduciary breach. So hopefully that case will go forward. And then we have another case in state court on behalf of the mass laborers against Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And state court is an interesting way to go if you're a plan and you say, I don't want to deal with trying to establish that you know, the carrier is a fiduciary because that takes a long time and you know it might not work. Well, these contracts can be regulated under state law. And so Massachusetts, we have a class case that's moving forward and we assert breach of contract and violations of 93A, which is a Deceptive Practices Act. And it says doing things like overbilling 
and not being, you know, not allowing access to see what you're doing and not telling what your prices are and things like that all violate the Massachusetts consumer statute and businesses can be consumers in Massachusetts. So if that is successful, that's a sort of another interesting route that employers could take to sort of go against their TPAs. And, you know, there's also Another weird place where employers are busy but you don't hear about it is in arbitration. So, you know, all of the administrative service agreements have a dispute resolution mechanism. And I think carriers are more likely to play ball if you're going to file an arbitration because it's private. No one ever finds out about it. There's no binding rules made. And so those seem to go quickly, settle, and but there is activity there. So that's it. So now we've done employees and employers. I'm probably running out of time, but now the third area that's really interesting is what the Department of Labor has been doing. So one is they've also been filing lawsuits against carriers. Um, first, about a year ago, they filed in conjunction with New York State Department of Finance a suit against a regional carrier for cross plan offsetting. How many people know what cross plan offsetting is? Huh? Sorry, then you're not doing fun reading on the weekends. But yes, so I've been involved in like too many cross plan offsetting cases, and it's just a terrible place to be. Um, but basically, what it says is, and a lot of plans have this and don't even know it. It says if an overpayment is made by the carrier, they can fix it by you know so an overpayment in any plan then they can use money from your plan for a covered claim and divert it back to themselves for that overpayment. So they'll just tell the employee, you'll get an EOB that says, okay, your claim was covered, at, and this is only out of network. Um, your claim was covered and we're gonna pay, you know, $1,800. But what the employee doesn't know is that they might divert some or all of that $1,800, never give it to the provider. So. In the night, you know, out of network means there's no agreement. So without ever even engaging the provider, they just take it. They say, you owe this to us, and we're sure of it. And so the, the provider hasn't had a chance to sort of give their side of the story. They just have the money taken from them. And then they are given the opportunity to appeal, but the plan isn't, and the participant isn't, and the participant could get a balanced bill from this. So the DOL doesn't like this. There was a case in um, Minnesota, P this case Peterson, and it, it the plans won, and a bunch of providers won, and the Department of Labor wrote an amicus brief saying this is illegal and it violates ERISA. And the district court agreed, and the Eighth Circuit also agreed. So it seemed like it might stop there, but you know it's extremely lucrative. I mean, United has it on their website. They love their overpayment bulk recovery program because they make billions of dollars a year doing it on both sides. They're so they're taking from every self-funded plan they administer all those offsets. If they made mistakes, they get to take them from those plans and put them back in their own pocket because everyone knows United needs more money in their pocket, you know, from you guys. And then if they give you money back from any other plan, they take a fee for doing it, even though they are the ones who made the overpayment. So it's a really crazy thing that the, that the judges don't really aren't all on board with this yet. But the Department of Labor did get a regional insurer recently to agree to never do cross plan offsetting again and to unwind like the past several years of offset transactions. And we actually have a claim in our case in state court in Massachusetts that cross plan offsetting violates state law, which makes it an automatic violation of the consumer laws because it just shouldn't be allowed. It, this is, again, it highlights the conflict of interest that exists when carriers are doing two things. Um, so the cross plan offsetting is interesting, but again, even though the Department of Labor has been very active and there was some early court wins, it's very difficult for participants, um, participants so far have been the challengers and they challenged the insurance carrier. And those have a iffy resolution and it's always on standing and it's always on like you didn't suffer a concrete injury even though you know there's a balance bill hanging out there. And I'm sorry, but an on a network provider, if they don't get paid from the first time they saw you, there could be a consequence. They could not want to see you again. They could want you to pay up front the next time. All of those things are damaged, but the courts have been very rigid on what they see as enough damage so far in this area. So another interesting thing that the Department of Labor is doing is suing Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. 
and they sued them for hidden fees. And it's a hidden fee. What they were doing was between 2016 and 2020, there was a provider fee, and in their provider agreements, they agreed to shift the costs into their plans, but they just didn't tell any of the plans. And they collected about $66 million in four years from 370 self-funded plans. So that's a lot of money. And nowhere was it listed as like a provider fee. It was just lumped in with claims costs. So this was always a no-no under ERISA. Hidden fees, no, that's a violation already. But here, so Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota actually tried to get the case dismissed and say the Department of Labor didn't have standing and that was unsuccessful. And then their argument is, and this is the argument, if you're an employer or an advisor, you hear all the time, if you, you signed an administrative service agreement where you promise that you're going to pay according to the terms, uh, you know, according to the terms of this contract and our provider agreements. So we don't have to tell you what the provider agreements say. This is in the provider agreement and you promise to pay it. This argument is trotted out over and over and over. And to be fair, employers can't say, oh, I'd like to sign this ASA. Please remove the part where I'm going to pay subject to your provider agreements because they're going to laugh at you and say, pound sand, that you have to. You have to agree. So it's really sort of a type of contractual provision that you're stuck with, sort of a, a provision of adhesion. And it's going to be interesting when eventually that is litigated further. But right now, the Department of Labor is litigating it. So if they can find it, we can all find it and plans need to be looking for things like that. And that's sort of a good rule of thumb is, all right, what do I want with my data? One thing in addition to looking for, am I paying good prices for drugs? Am I you know, not overpaying? Did I get right good compensation disclosures? Um, are there any hidden fees in here? Is there, are there amounts I don't understand? And that's why you have to push back when you don't understand how a claim was paid. And being given an answer that says it was paid according to the contract is not sufficient because how do you know? You know, that you can't just take their word for it. That's not monitoring. So that is a real sort of area of on the ground conflict all the time. And the DOL luckily is sort of taking a lead on that right now. Then we have regional subpoenas that have been issued recently by the Department of Labor, and they are to two regional plans in Minnesota. So there's sort of independent TPAs, and you can buy their plans off the shelf, and the subpoenas are because they're for mental health parity violations. So this is another example of, you know, be careful who your TPA is, because if the TPA has a non-compliant plan and you're using it, you're exposed and have a non-compliant plan. And so mental health parity is a really tough area for plans right now. I, I'm not even sure sometimes how to advise them, except for do everything possible to get the, the analyses that were performed by the person that created the plan. So you have to perform this analysis and report, but presumably the carrier or TPA that created your plan also did this. And so they should share with you their analysis and you can look at it and see if you think it's adequate, if it missed anything, but it's very difficult to get the amount of data that you need to really do a proper analysis. If you try and if you sort of, you know, make sure that the process you went through is, is somewhere memorialized, that makes it less likely that you would be the target of future litigation. So that's why it's really important to be good fiduciaries and have a process in place because it's unclear where the challenges are going to come from. There's only so much you can do. But if you have a good fiduciary process, that's the most protective thing that a plan can do against litigation. So then the fourth area of, of activity here is Congress. And Congress has all of a sudden just, you know, they read, I don't know, did anyone read the New York Times reporting on multi-plan? Okay, so you're all cooler than I am, fine. But there was a series of articles about how multi-plan is like a scam and how they work with, you know, all of the bukas. And a lot of times they reprice these claims super low. You don't know what the algorithm is. And multi-plan and the carrier make more money than the provider once it's repriced and the plan never knows any of this. So this 
scandalized Congress, apparently, and they started asking for testimony about it, and they really wanted to learn about it, which is good. And now they're writing letters to the DOL asking them about, like, what is this repricing? And, you know, what's going on? So repricing is problematic, and savings fees, you know, that's where savings fees first comes up, but savings fees are a nightmare throughout plans for, for employers, and I think there's, once that thread starts to be pulled, I think that more transparency into that is going to be what's next. But in June, Congress wrote a letter to the Department of Labor, and they said, hey, you know, maybe we think you should make new guidance that every health plan has to do a 5500. And that 5500 has to include certain claims data information, including fees from repricing. And so I think it's really interesting. They got a lot of testimony from the ERISA community and, and from the benefits community before they issued that. And then they also, in the same letter, announced that they were very concerned about improper denials and the low rate of appeal of improper denials. And I'm not sure exactly what they want the Department of Labor to do about that, but they're right. And you know, there was a study done by you know Kaiser Family Foundation. And some, in some Medicare Advantage plan, like 87% of the denials that were challenged were overturned. And so a lot of denials, you know, the suggestion is are improper in the first instance and should be challenged, but it's just too daunting of a process. And the second letter, which just went out on August 20th, is to the enforcement arm of the Department of Labor, EBSA, which is the Employee Benefits Security Agency. And it's like, hey, How's it going enforcing this new 408B2 compensation disclosure rule from the Consolidated Appropriations Act? Do you need money? Can you tell us what obstacles you're running into? And so this is the most interesting and will have the most soon effect for plans because Congress wants guidance issued on how 408B2 disclosures, um, you know, more guidance so that you start getting them from more than just the broker and also whether they're sufficient and um, they've even, the Department of Labor has created a task force that's called Welfare Plan Disclosure Working Group. So it sounds like they're about to get more involved like they did in the sort of disclosures in 401k plans, and that would really benefit everyone. And then I think I have like two minutes left, so that's sort of the CAA landscape. So as you can see, there's sort of employee, employer, the Department of Labor, Congress, everyone's sort of doing stuff. But then there's also, this is a great time to be doing stuff in healthcare, right? I mean, it's like a renaissance and you can do all kinds of things and creativity is, is all of a sudden okay again. And you have state attorney generals suing PBMs, and those are largely successful, and they're able to claw back a lot of money. I think there's been like five of them so far. Then you have the Department of Justice just created a task force called a task force on healthcare monopolies and collusion. So that sounds fun, right? And that's going to be an interesting task force. And then... Um, there's this sort of other set of antitrust suits that are gaining ground and they're doing well. So there's suits against multi-plan and there's a bunch of them I can't even keep track anymore. They're brought by hospital systems, by plans, by employees, by everyone saying this is a scam, you're, you know, you, you're not repricing based on anything and it's an antitrust violation, it's anti-competitive behavior and usually it's against like multi-plan and 70,000 insurance carriers, whoever's using data eyesight. So those are interesting. Many of them have RICO claims attached to them. And then there's the antitrust um, litigation against huge hospital systems like HCA and Sutter Health. And the Sutter Health one was successful. And it was like, you know, you're driving prices up because you have this anti-competitive behavior. And that resulted in a huge settlement. Um, and there was a settlement against the Blues a few years ago in Alabama for like two and a half billion dollars over anti-competitive behavior. And so really, at the end of the day, that's what all of this is that's happening, is anti-competitive behavior. So it, the inability to get information isn't just to keep you in the dark, it's also to keep anyone else from coming in because there's all this sort of vertical integration that's occurred. And so you say, I want my own payment integrity vendor. And you're told, oh, we do that better. We do payment integrity, pay us to do it. But you cannot pay the fox to guard the hen house. It's not like, that's not how you monitor. So don't be wooed by that. And it's not really as sufficient in the eyes of, of the Department of Labor. And then finally, um, there's sort of, you know, these new laws that states are trying to do to increase transparency. And while they might not apply to an ERISA plan, they apply to contracts between ERISA plans and vendors. So Texas, 
um, Nevada and Connecticut so far have passed laws where it's now illegal to have a gag clause in a contract between a provider and a carrier that prevents a third party, the plan, from accessing information and data and things like that. It's also illegal under all three of those laws um, to prevent plans from carving out services from steering, from tiering, as someone was talking about tiering earlier. So these are all things that if you're in the right location, you can start taking advantage of now, and that sort of is gonna spread because there's a bunch more pending and states are really leaning into transparency. So the CAA has caused a lot of change. The future looks bright when it comes to you know all the efforts to increase transparency, but also a little scary if you're an employer. So the best thing you can do is understand what your responsibilities are, what the rules are under the CAA, and do everything possible to comply with them, even if it means you have to sort of make some changes. And that's it. Thank you.